One of the first things we should do, since this entire module is about APIs, is we should talk about what actually is an API. Well, sort of the stuffy definition for an API, or rather what does an API stand for, is the Application Programming Interface. However, this is just another one of those programming acronyms that is more confusing if you learn what it actually stands for. So that can lead to more confusion. Let's put it in simpler terms. The way that I like to think about what an API is, is that it's any tool that will help connect your program with someone else's program. This definition I came up with is intentionally vague, and that's because an API can do multiple things. So first, I think it's helpful to think in terms of a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, you sit at your table and maybe you're with your family, you've got your own system happening there at the table. Now, of course, your purpose for being at the restaurant is to place an order and to receive some food. However, there's more than one system at play at a restaurant, but the primary one we're concerned with is the kitchen. Back in the kitchen, there's an entire ecosystem of work that's happening essentially without your knowledge. Now, you know that it's there and you know that it's happening, but you don't need to know as patron of the restaurant exactly how things work on the other side of the restaurant in the kitchen, for example. Instead, you're sort of, if you kind of stretch the analogy a little bit, given some documentation on how the restaurant works. You could call that documentation the menu. So you look at a menu, you know what is available to you, and that's how you essentially can place a command or an order to the kitchen. Now there's an in-between. And that in-between is your server, your waiter, your waitress, the person that will talk to you and then go talk to the kitchen and relay the order to them. This waiter or waitress server, this person is analogous to the API. The restaurant has made available a portal for you to interface between your party, your family, and the restaurant itself. So think of that waiter or waitress as the API, the in-between between your system and their system, or bringing it back to programming, your program and their program. Now, like I said, this definition here is intentionally vague, and that's because I personally have heard API used in sort of vague terms. And I kind of want to talk about the two main ones that I hear about. The one that we will mostly be concerned with in this module as we are talking about interfacing with servers, getting data from databases and so forth, is getting data from a server. Now the server that you interact with hosts an API. And in this scenario, that API consists of exposed endpoints, which we'll be defining a little bit later, where we can get access to data from the server. However, it's important to note that the server doesn't just give us access to absolutely everything on the server because that would be a pretty significant security risk, but instead they open up just the things that they want us to have access to. Kind of like how the restaurant will give us a menu of items that we can order from, but they won't give us an entire list of all the ingredients and allow us to just make our own dishes. I guess it maybe depends on the kind of restaurant you're at, but I'm just talking about a traditional one. And so when you hear me talk about an API throughout this module, I'm mostly talking about this kind of API where there's a server and a database that lives somewhere outside of my computer where I can where I can request of the server to send me back some data that I can use. However, I think it's important to touch on a different, not definition, but I guess use case of APIs 
and that's when there is pre-written code that allows you to do cool stuff. This is probably most obvious with something like the DOM API, which includes things like dot get element by ID, which you have used up until now, along with any of the other DOM API methods you may have used. Now, this is code that's pre-written by the creators of JavaScript that allows us to do some cool stuff, but we don't really know how get element by ID is doing what it's doing. Instead, it's a method that is exposed to us or given to us to do that task. And that way, all we have to do is say document dot get element by ID and pass a predefined parameter, which is the string ID of the element in the HTML that we want to grab. But we don't need to know how it's doing what it's doing. Something like this is sometimes referred to as a black box. We don't know what's happening on the inside, but we just know what it returns to us. And so there's plenty of examples like this. There's array methods, for example, like dot filter dot map. This is in a way kind of like an API. There's something happening in the background when we call an array method like dot filter. The same thing goes for maybe local storage. We have access to local storage dot get item, local storage dot set item. We don't need to know how it's doing what it's doing. Those are pieces of an API that we get to use. Remember, again, the API is any tool that helps us connect our program with someone else's program. In the case of their program, we're talking about... I'm gonna grab some coffee.
the program, the JavaScript that someone else has written. And then pretty much any third party package that anybody has ever created, it has an API. They expose methods or functions that you can use as a part of their API, as a part of their program. We don't need to know how all of those methods work behind the scenes. Of course, with open source stuff, we could just probably go to GitHub and look at how it's doing things under the hood. And there's a ton more. Now, this many more is mostly referring to the web APIs. If you click this link here, that'll send you to the Mozilla Developer Network list of web APIs, and you'll see that there's dozens and dozens of them. It's pretty cool the kinds of things you can do, like push notifications and geolocation querying, even things like figuring out the ambient light on certain devices and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty impressive what they've given us access to. But again, when I talk about an API in this module, I'm mostly talking about getting data from a server. So hopefully that kind of clarifies what API is and don't get bogged down in technical definitions like application programming interface. So because I don't just want to lecture at you, I want to give you a little bit of a quiz. Let me write something up really quick. All right, so here's a quick quiz. Pause here, answer these questions, and then we'll go through them really quick together. Okay, well, API stands for Application Programming in Local Storage. Okay, hopefully you were able to... Let's start off by talking about clients and servers. So what exactly are clients and what exactly are servers? Well, a client is any device that connects to the internet to get data from somewhere. Now, this is a device that you probably use on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, if you're sitting here watching this screencast, probably on a laptop or maybe a mobile device, you are using a client. That client is making requests or sending requests and getting or receiving responses back with some data, like, for example, the audio stream that you're listening to. And these clients can be more than just your computer, although it could be a laptop or a desktop or whatever, or other traditional clients we think of, like like a phone or tablet. It's really anything that sends signals or requests out to a server and gets a response back, like a smartwatch or maybe a video doorbell or a robot vacuum. And like it says here, even a server in certain circumstances can act as a client. Well, that's a little more complex to understand. We won't cover it right now. So then what exactly is a server? Well, a server is the computer that's on the other side of this equation. It accepts requests that come from a client asking for something and then responds to that client with that thing. Sometimes the request is like an HTML page, an image or a file, a video stream, or it might just be plain data in, for example, a JSON format. So I've mentioned request and response a few times already. You're going to be seeing this diagram where we have the client on the left and the server on the right. We'll come back to this diagram when we talk about requests and responses. But in the meantime, I've written up a little bit of a quiz here. So I want you to read through these questions and come up with your own answers to them. And then we'll go through it together. Pause now and work on this quiz. Confuse oh. me the page that I can fit into what that means with request and response. A little bit too many. So let's talk about yes. the request and response cycle. I think I answered all, it before. What exactly is the request response cycle? Well, let's just do one at a time. What is a request? We've mostly mentioned this in the previous lesson, but it's whenever a device or a client asks for some sort of resource. And that resource could be device as action or apply to the request. It's when a server contain the resource that was asked for, like the HTML page or the JSON data or whatever. However, it's also possible that something might have gone wrong. For example, if the client device isn't authorized to receive the resource that it asked for, then in a little diagram, we're going to visualize this. You've got the client or your device on the left in your saying, here you is OK. Then that index likely bond with 200 OK. Then successfully, it's important to point out that these status messages are already tied to the status code. So a quiz here. You're, but the point is, I want to get you out there with your hands on the keyboard, being curious, thinking about yeah. more than just, I guess, regurgitating what I've told you already. Okay, so, let's go to this. What you see before you is fairly simple. And I mean, you can even see 
I have 14 lines of HTML. I have 11 lines of JavaScript. Let's get my coffee. And I've included, well, I guess the CSS is the most here. And when we build this together, we're going to build it completely from the ground up. I'm not going to skip any steps with you. Hopefully that will give you a chance to project to really drive some of the syntax that we'll be learning together in this section. So without further ado, let's dive right in. At this point in the course, you should have already learned about JSON, but I thought it might be a good time to do a page property gen be surrounded in double quotes. And, as, and if I wanted to have a Boolean value, I wouldn't use the string true, for example, it would just be any network tab. Now in this module, we are mostly concerned with JSON because it's the format for the data that is going to be sent to us. Well, and that we're gonna be sending out as well. Now come, Click on the link up here, that'll take you there. But while I was there, I thought I would show you how you can look at your own network tab, read it over into JSON Lint, and I hit this validate JSON button, and what that will do is it'll tell me that it's valid JSON. This is useful if, for example, I'm typing out my own JSON for something, and I just want to make sure I formatted it exactly. It needs to be exactly right with the double quotes and the commas at the end and everything. So JSON Lint is helpful. You can come Click on the link up here, that'll take you there. But while I was there, I thought I would show you how you can look at your own network tab and see the JSON that comes in. So if you were to right click, this doesn't have to be on JSON Lint, it can be on any website, and click the inspect icon. This may be a little bit different depending on which browser you're using. This will bring up your developer tools. By default, it will show you the elements tab, which is great if you're doing HTML and CSS kind of debugging or testing, but I would like you to go over to the network tab. And once you're over to the network tab, you'll see something that kind of looks like this. Now, one thing you might notice is I've clicked this XHR filter, which means it's not going to show me every request or network request and response that I have made from this website, but instead it's just going to filter out the XHR requests. We haven't really talked much about XHR, but it's an AJAX request that usually receives JSON as a response. Don't be too concerned about that. But the point is, I was able to see that JSON lint, for example, on this third AJAX request or XHR request, I was able to click on it and see that it was sending a post request out to... Let's see if I have it in here. Do, 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 do. Um, finish responsive. Responsive uh, explore page.
Okay. Commit. Okay, it's good. Let's see GitHub. Probably would not see it on today. But yesterday. Wait, what? I didn't commit anything yesterday. I thought I committed. I have to manually do this. I need I will need to learn about Git as well. A little bit. But let's see with our apps. Network Fetch Yes, nothing Make this Content Companion Chrome extension. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> it's great, and it got a status code of 200 in return. And if you click the preview tab in sort of this sub menu, you can actually see the JSON data that was being sent out. This top line in black is a representation of the object. You can see there's an ellipsis here that says there's more properties to this object. And if you click the little drop down arrow, it'll actually enumerate. Enumerate. keys and values that were being sent. Now I'm not like logged into JSON Lint or anything. I'm assuming that these numbers don't really mean anything meaningful to us. But this is kind of a fun little habit to get into. You can go to any website that you normally might use. Maybe try going to Facebook, opening your developer tools, going to the network tab. If you want to make it a little easier to parse through the long list of network requests that are being made, sending JSON, be using JSON pretty extensively. We want to refresh our knowledge of JSON. Play around in your dev tools, check out jsonlint.com, and when you feel ready, let's keep going forward.
our example, they put their dot then blocks on the next line. We're going to go in detail onto what this actually means and what it's doing a bit later. And let's see, it says that dot then receives a response. Now I have an arrow, which means that this is actually a function. So dot then receives a function that will take a response and it returns response.json. So we'll say response arrow response.json. And that was a function as well. Then on the next line, there's another dot then where we have our data and they just console log the data. Data arrow console log data. Let me open the console since we'll be logging this. I'll hit run and it's pretty simple JSON that's coming back. It's an object that has two properties, a message property, which has an image on it and a status property, which says success. And just based on the URL, as I'm recording this, even though you may have gotten a different one since it's a random image, the one that I got in response looks like it's an Australian Terrier just based on the URL. Now, again, we're going to dive a lot deeper into promises and understanding exactly what this syntax is doing. But until then, we're going to get a lot of practice with actually just typing this out the way it is. Hmm. If you have one. My little noise. Shiba. Okay, what if I print it out? Message. Let's do a dip.
quick aside I want to talk about before we continue. One thing that will be really helpful to understand, we'll kind of gloss over this idea now and we'll cover it much more in detail later, is the fact that the code that you write inside of your dot then function, this function inside of the dot then, the order in which this is executed will be different than you might expect. Let me kind of show you what I mean. Let me put it above my fetch a console log the first console log. And then I'm going to move another console log down here and we'll say the second console log. And then we're already console logging the data inside of this dot then. Intuition as your first learning coding might tell you that this will run from the top down, kind of like we read a book. And we would see console log the first console log. It would do the fetch request. It would change the JSON response into JavaScript. It would then console log the data, and then it would console log the second console log string here. Well, let's run this and see what happens. Let me open the console. And you probably noticed it said the first console log, the second console log, and then we got the data. And this is the beauty of asynchronous JavaScript. Asynchronous just means it's happening out of order or out of time. The beauty of these dot then blocks is they don't block the other code in your JavaScript program from running. They allowed this console log to run before the response from this fetch request ever came back from the server and then kind of ran these other blocks. It all may have seemed to happen pretty quick, but I think something that might be really illustrative here is let me do a quick for loop we're gonna do run this code a hundred times in fact let's put this console log in there and we'll say inside the for loop I'll hit save to run my program and well okay so scrimba's console shows a hundred next to I'm inside the for loop and that's because it ran that console log a hundred times so we got the first console log the second console log 100 instances of the console log I'm inside the for loop and then if you were watching closely it even then took you know another few milliseconds before the console log of our data came back this is just a taste of asynchronous JavaScript. We are going to touch on this in a lot more depth later in the course, but hopefully that gives you some insight into exactly what's happening or maybe even clarifies something that you've been confused about. With that said, let's keep moving forward in the course. In this challenge, you're essentially going to be doing the same thing that you did before when you did your first fetch, but this time you're going to take the URL that you received from the dog API and put it into the DOM, actually display it on our screen over here. Obviously, feel free to look back at that or use the Google resources that we talked about in that last video to help you get started, but go ahead, pause now and work on this challenge. Okay, fetch data. Fetch API. <laughs> Fetch the website. right here and then we do what dot then method response to here is respond json response dot json then we need to do is a function. We don't need commas. Dot then data uh, console blah, blah data. Okay, now we need to do data. Uh, so it's a function that take in data. So let's do const image equal document can okay, element by D image.
assuming this is how it is. Document dot get element by ID. Then we do ig. Then we do a function, right? Let's do this. Then we do g dot inner html equal to my image tag with a source equal to this and then uh, we do hash key what do we do here message data dot message let's see there we go boom boom not too shabby what did i do Okay, we do document at element ID. That's nice. What if let's go to our hiking app? We might be able to do this, right? So cons HTTP. What if we use fetch instead? Rapid API, Rapid API, and then let's go to JavaScript fetch cons option method get headers. Da -da 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 -da. Does it matter? Let's do outdoor. We we'll put in in city, country, United States. Four years. Copy code. Then respond. Respond. Catch. Okay. What about now? Okay. Not too bad, not too bad, guys. Not too bad. Let's see example response. Test endpoint. Let's give you the same things. Latitude, does it matter? State, California. Uh, city Huntington Beach. So when the users search for a city, is using this I mean it, it going to input the country the city I mean city wow wow it's actually nice it's actually nice let's go back to this well let's start with number one we're going to fetch the resource I put the URL up here and on the next line I like to do it on the next line just to keep it simple otherwise it gets kind of long on this one line we'll say with the response that comes back we're going to change the body of the response from JSON into JavaScript that's what response.json does and then we'll have access to the data and once again let's just start by console logging the data Let's save my console and okay this is where we ended last time now data is an object it has a message property we want to do more than just console log this I'm going to open the body of this function and currently I have well so you need the curly braces as well yeah so let's try it put it in there Boom, boom, does it still work? What is this? Uh, let's just do console.log data. I think it's a boxes. Malamut, that's nice. 
run it again. We've got a, a Terry. How cute this is. Well, nothing on my browser, so over in my HTML. I guess I could create an image and have it have an empty source, although I think that's actually bad practice, and then add the source in the JavaScript. Instead, I think what I'll do is create a div where I can put this image and then just create the image in JavaScript. More styling can set the inner HTML to equal. I'm going to use a template string so I can just put this on its own line. And yeah, basically the same thing that I do. Practice this fetch syntax with these dot then blocks, which still probably are a bit unfamiliar. Yeah, let's try and see response console.log response. So we had a response now. What we need to do is basically loop through. Oh, first of all, we need to listen to what the user input into our app. So this is the app that I'm basically building. You have search, right? Search bar. Let's do all the console.log. API hiking API request fetch request okay now we do uh, dom elements so let's do const bunch of cons. First, we need to listen to this. And we need to listen to the input. As, and then we need to listen to the buttons. Is it a buttons? Yeah, let's do ID. ID search BTN. Okay, that's nice. Search btn equal document dot get element by id. Then we do search btn. Right, then we need to listen. Then we need to get the search input. Equal document that get element by D, and then we do such input, such input. Let's go to our. There we go. ID. Search input. So now what we need to do is basically listening for the value of the search input. When the user click the search buttons, it's basically just run this get response. And then it's a change, change this, maybe, or take you to the explore page. I'm not too sure. Search. What did, did it do? Like when you click search. Let's go to like a real hiking app. Hiking app. All trail. All trail looks like a really popular one. Blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Explore. Okay, so when you click into the city, let's do Huntington Beach. It's going to give you. Ah, oh, it's give you the list of this. Maybe a change for the city as well. Not too sure how would this look. If 
but it looks nice. I don't know how to do with the the image here, uh, with the map here, but basically, what I need to do is basically search, and then it's going to print out. Like, let's change city name. Not too sure. Not too sure. Not too sure about this. But basically, that is when explore curated trail near you. How do I get the review here? Okay, let's just move back to our course. Okay, we're going to cover these more in detail later, but also hopefully a little bit of a callback to inner HTML and DOM manipulation and so forth. If you're still feeling a little bit uncomfortable with this, of course, spend as much time here as you can. You could delete this mm. entire thing and start again. What about pop-up? Like a pop-up windows? I click search and then it's going to pop up right in front of you. You have a bunch of trail that you can try. And then you just need to go back, right? Okay. Okay, okay. I think I know how. Let's just move back to our course. From scratch, and whenever you're ready, let's keep going forward. Well, if you know my teaching style, you know I'm all about the repetition. So, what your challenge is this time is you're going to fetch a random activity from the board API. Here is the URL. Okay, so let's do fetch. Mm, activity, right? So first we need an API. Uh, we, first we need a HTTP. Copy this, paste it into here. And then on this next line, what we need to do is then response. And then we do what? Respond.json. I'm assuming. I remember that's how I do it. Uh, then we do data. Data console.log data. Try it. Respond.json. Board API. Respond at JSON fetch API respond dot JSON JSON we need is a f we need double brackets so it's like a function yeah it's a function respond dot JSON now we need to display the text of the activity into the browser. So we do a diff. Mm. Diff slash diff. What we need to do is an ID and then we do hey, activity. Activity containers. Okay. Next, we do this. Then, do let's do activity containers document get element by ID and activity containers. dot data this dot in the HTML here is going to be P 
<coughs> slash p this is going to be the activity uh, data dot activity let's see watch the sunset let's console dot lock when we um, Right, so plant some pots, pot some plants, and put them around your house. Okay, type relaxation participant one prize. That you will use, and once you get that activity, display the text of the activity URL found up here. Basically, got it. So let's, we never really do it in the real world. Pretty simple for now. Um, instead, I think what I'll do is maybe this time I will create an H1 placeholder, and this is where the text is going to be. But for now, Leave it empty. I'll give it an ID so it's easy to select. We'll say activity name, maybe. So if you, again, this kind of repetition, I, I don't intend it to be busy work at all. Awesome. Well, we've got the very basics of what we want to do with our board bot kind of started here. So let's keep moving forward and keep building out the board bot. Board bots. Before we get too far and this becomes kind of a confusing thing, I wanted to address why we're using this URL where it's apis.scrimba.com instead of if you happen to do a quick search for the board API, the real URL that they use, which is boardapi.com slash API slash activity. The only reason you'll see a number of these apis.scrimba.com links here when we're fetching from an API is purely a logistical thing. It's trying to solve an issue where if sometime down the road the board API decides that they want to shut their doors or not really support any more requests or anything like that, that these lessons that are using the board API don't become obsolete. In fact, here on Scrimba, on some of my other courses, I've recorded lessons that were using, for example, an API called swappy.co, but then swappy.co got removed or whoever was running the website decided to take it down and somebody else popped up and had swappy.dev. Well, because mm. of the difference here, all of a sudden, all of my screencasts are a little bit broken. Students who are trying to run their code with swappy.co aren't able to. Anyway, long story short, the reason that you'll see a number of apis.scrimba.com is just so that we can have the API be a little bit more evergreen so these courses won't become obsolete if something were to change or break on the API. Many of these APIs are completely open source, including the data that they provide, and so we've just simply put that on our own Scrimba servers so that we can kind of have a little bit more control over the longevity of that API. So again, just wanted to address that for now in case there was any kind of confusion. You'll see a number of these apis.scrimba.com URLs as we go throughout this course and other courses. And that's about it. Let's keep going forward. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going forward. Okay, let's start building out the skeleton for the board bot. We're going to start let's with the HTML, and I have a challenge here for you to work through. I've commented out the JavaScript because we're not going to be terribly concerned with this quite yet. Let's actually get some elements on the screen so that we have something to interact with. Pause here, read through this challenge, and start working on it. Okay, so that will include the title for the app. Uh, bot bot, place holder element that will be populated with random ideas we get from the API. So. Basically, what we need is an H1. Let's do like a logo, something like that. Title. Da -da 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 -da. A button to click for trigger to get a request to the board API. And the event listeners and then when on click this fetch it's going to run so what we need to do is now let's just do the title 
first card is board API board bot style like slime status maybe a color Red. Okay. Mm-hmm. Include this. Placeholder element that will be populated with the random idea we get from, yeah, let's do it quick. Let's do an H3 instead of H1, All right? Uh, a diff. Let's remove this. Do a diff here and then ID uh, board ideas. Okay, and then we just do a template string on this. All right, first of all, what you need to do is const oh, button as well. So a button, a buttons. Uh, buttons, click me. Need ideas. Let's do margin. Margin zero auto. Expect what? Expect an input. Okay. So we do uh, idea BTN. BTN. Margin zero auto. Does it work? Buttons. Expect end of input. Cons. Ideas. BTN equal document. That get element by D. Now we do ideas btn right so it's just this and then this for the sake of simplicity we need to do idea btn dot add event listeners so it's going to run a function first of all it's click then basically put this in mm. here boop document dot get element by ID activity name Right, activity name, text, content, take a nap, there we go. So let's do the template string, 
in the HTML since we have like a lot of activity and the uh, there's a lot of content that we can put into like activity type something like that let's do hmm like an h1 h3 and then slash h3 Mm, 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 mm. data and then dot activity then we do the same things maybe like a p p p and then we do like type other than that other than that i think it's good go to nail salon type relaxation go to the movie in, in the theater with a few friends show show do we need to put price participant one other than that, that's good. Placeholders, populate random. Probably just something simple like find a little tiny button there. That's fine. We're going to get a section where it's here so that it actually looks decent. One thing that's hard about these kinds of projects is when I ask you to do something super open-ended, like, for example, adding some styling, I totally understand that might be a bit difficult to spend a bunch of time and effort doing that, only because once you hit play and watch me do it, all of your work is essentially going to go away. Now, you can click down here in the right grid or gradient. It's just kind of a silvery gray look of it and share it in the Discord channel. We always love seeing people's submissions and really love seeing... Next up, we will hook up this button to our actual board API. I think we do that. We did that. So yeah, let's move to the second one. REST API. So just a recap, it's basically just, you ask for something, you ask for like a dat database. Yeah, you call, you call like a let's say that number is like a an API, right? And then we call that numbers. Numbers are going to attach to something. Let's say like here a board board API. And then it's going to give you back the information that you need. And then yeah, it's basically that. Let's go to the next part. Let's go to the next part was URLs, REST, REST API, and then, yeah, let's go to here. In this section, we're going to be diving deeper into some of these most basic components of a request, and that includes URLs and REST. All the while, we'll be building our blog space project. And this blog space project is essentially pulling down data from the JSON placeholder API. We just have some sort of lorem ipsum placeholder text. We go to the restroom.
Okay. Blog titles and blog bodies. We're only going to grab the first five or so, but we're also going to be able to include new stuff here. So we'll have like a new title, a new body. We'll hit post and that will add it to our list here. This will also be our first foray into sending data to a server, not just always pulling data down from a server. In this section, we are going to be talking about requests in a lot more detail than what we covered previously. We'll also be learning about URLs, which may not seem like something you need to learn too much about, but in reality, there's quite a bit to understand when it comes to interacting with an API. So we'll be learning about not just URLs, but URL parameters and queries, query strings, and so forth. That will lead us naturally into a discussion about REST API design, what exactly that means, and how you as a developer can use that to your benefit as you interact with more and more APIs that exist out there for you to interact with. And of course, all of this will be built in the context of our blog space project. So without further ado, let's jump right in. In the previous section, we covered the request response cycle. And at this point, it's going to be- Yeah, most of this course is, has like a structure of like theory, the boring part and then we start implementing the, the boring part into the fun part which is building projects and then it's just a recap of everything that we learned so the first probably I would say three to five uh, video is quite torturing I mean like boring uh, and then and then it's coming to the fun part and it's coming to the fun let's part dive a little bit deeper into HTTP and then, yeah. requests but first let's do a quick recap of the request response cycle you might remember that a request is simply when a client for example the computer that you're using right now asks for a resource from a server a resource can be anything like an HTML page or JSON an image file or anything like that and then the server's job is to send back a response in response to the request that came in so a response is when a server responds to the client and the truth is sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't either way it's considered a response from the server I guess if we wanted to really split hairs there are times when a server just doesn't respond at all and that's usually called a request timeout but that's a little outside the scope of this lesson right now so I mentioned earlier HTTP request well what does HTTP stand for it stands for hypertext transfer protocol and Kind of like we've talked about before, that's just another one of those acronyms that might cause insecurity or confusion or imposter syndrome or something like that. So let me see if I can come up with my own definition. First of all, a protocol is just an agreed upon standard way of doing something. If you think of it outside the context of web development, you've certainly heard the term protocol before. Like, what's the protocol for doing such and such a thing? And it just means what's the way that we have previously agreed upon that this thing should be done. So that's all a protocol is. And HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol is a protocol or an agreed upon way of doing things for determining how hypertext, or we can just think of it as text, should be transferred over the internet. I think if you looked deeper down, you might see that HTTP also includes something called hypermedia, which means it's not just sending text like an HTML page or some JavaScript or JSON or something like that, but it also can include the transfer of media such as files. Maybe don't quote me on that because I'm certainly not an expert on the intricacies of HTTP. Yeah, but I understand I that. But I hope this has demystified a little bit HTTP <laughs> in general. You've certainly seen it many, many times. Every time you have a URL in a browser, it starts with HTTP or HTTPS, which is just the secure or more secure version of HTTP. For now, this is really all we need to know. We're not going to dive really deep into HTTP. You obviously can do as much research on it as you want, but at this point in the career path, it's not going to be crucial for you to understand all the tiny intricate details. So an HTTP request will have a number of components. 
The first thing is called the path, and I like to call this the URL because that's a okay. little more human so friendly. So the, the fetch stuff is like a when request. When your client sends a request to a server, it needs to have a URL where it is sending that request to. Or put another way, the server is sort of, you could say, living at a specific address, and that's the URL <laughs> that you are sending your request off to. The next thing is a method. Your request will always include some sort of method. And these include things like get, post, put, and delete as your most common methods that you'll see. But there are a number of other ones like something called patch and options that you'll probably run into but won't likely have to use very often yourself. We'll be diving deeper into methods later, so I won't talk about each one. Hmm. Although I do like to point out at this point that you'll notice that these are all capitalized. And that's just a standard that you'll see with request methods. They're usually all capitalized like this. The next thing is the request body. And truthfully, this one is sort of optional. You will include a body in some requests. You won't include a body in other requests. And we'll be talking about exactly what it is and when you send that later. And last but not least are the headers. And the headers are sort of like meta information about the request. They can include details like meta what kind of browser or operating system is sending this request. Sometimes this will include things like an authentication token if you are asking for a protected resource. There's actually dozens or maybe even hundreds of different headers that you can have, so I won't be able to go into all of them, but it's just meta information about the request, extra information that isn't included in the path, the method, or the body. So once again, I don't like to just sort of lecture at you. So I'm going to write up a challenge for you to do. And I'm also going to write up a quiz that will kind of test if you've been paying attention. Okay, skip the quiz. And would you guessed it, except for the URL, it's going to assume that you're sending a get request to get data from this URL. Awesome work. Hopefully that was helpful. When you feel ready, let's keep moving forward. So we talked about some of the components of a request. Now we're going to dive deeper into each one of these. And if you're curious, on the Google Slides that I've linked here, I actually left in all of the old slides from previous lessons. I'm going to keep building on top of this so that you have quick access to the stuff that we've already talked about, just in case you would like to go back and review. So let's start off by talking about the path, or like I mentioned, I like to just think of it as the URL. As a part of the request, the URL is essentially the address where your desired resource lives. In the end- Wait, I just wanna make sure, are there any APIs for like Amazon product? That would be a, a genius API. Let's see rapid API. Let's see if we can have like a much madness. Ooh. Wow. Basketball API. There's so many API. I don't know why people just keep building movie apps. They have like March, March Madness, basketball. Not, not a basketball guy anymore. But th this is so cool. Country season league. Oh, wow. Let's see if there's any Amazon API, Amazon product price, e-commerce. John Leo. Async provide will be searched by local provide. Rapid key. What? This is Async. Record parameters. This is so nice. This is so nice. What is this Async? Paste it on here. Let's do Amazon. Let's see Amazon and then we paste in the ASIN. Is it like the light? Litiao, Litiona, Litona, Litonia. If 
find keywords for no shit I just <laughs> product price wow I might consider building it this always boils down to an IP address. We're not going to dive deep into that because on a human readable level, we always associate IP addresses with some sort of URL. And the URLs for an API can usually be broken up into kind of two portions. First of all, there's the base URL, and then there's something called the endpoint. Now we've been using these up until now. We just may not have known the words. So let's take a look at a familiar example a base URL is going to be the portion of the URL that will not change no matter what kind of resource you're getting from this API. So for example, if I'm using the Scrimba version of the JSON placeholder API, every request I make will start with the base URL of https colon slash slash apis.scrimba.com slash json placeholder. So my endpoint is going to be the specific resource at that base URL that I want to get. For example, there's a slash posts endpoint, and that represents a list of blog posts that live at this API. So when you put them together, you get the full API or the full URL, which is the apis.scrimba.com slash json placeholder slash posts. And in the case of the json placeholder, Let's click on, oh, it's just a bunch of uh, tags. Okay, got it. 31, 32, 34, ID, blah, 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 blah. API, there's other endpoints that we can access too, like slash users, I think it is, or slash albums, I think. There's a few of them there. You can go to the JSON placeholder API documentation to see the full list. Now, you'll notice that I've actually created a link here with this full URL, and that's because if you were to click this link, your browser would send a get request to this URL. Now, usually when we click on links, we think of it as a way to open a new website. But under the hood, the browser is doing the exact same thing. When you click a link like this, it's going to do a get request to the URL that you're linking to. And if the API or if that URL contains an HTML page as a resource, then your browser will just load it like normal. This is what happens when you click a link to any website or even if you type into your browser's URL bar, say google.com and hit enter. Now your browser won't load an HTML page per se, but what it will load is the JSON response. And it's able to display that and you can see the JSON in the browser. If you haven't already clicked on this link, this is essentially what would show up. You click on the link and it shows you your JSON in the browser. And this should look familiar to us. We have an array of objects and we have a title and a body. That's because the JSON placeholder has returned some blog posts. Now, personally, in Chrome, I have an extension that formats JSON when it comes back. And it looks like this for me. I can click these little arrows to collapse and expand different sections if I need to. I can also always see the raw version, which is what we see back here. If I want to, I can switch back and forth there. And I've included a link here to the JSON formatter Chrome extension. If JSON formatters, see at the Chrome, boom. Okie dokie. Using Chrome and move back. In, it. in fact, using your browser can be a really good way to see what the data looks like when it comes back. Up until now, we've been console logging a lot of stuff, but when you have a URL, you can always just enter it into your browser and look at the JSON that comes. Really? Let's see, Rapid API? I use Rapid API because it's like a huge, huge, huge marketplace for API. Let's see, explore. Boom. What? Invalid key. Dun, 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 dun. 
where do I put the keys? Maybe here. How can I access to this? Maybe the keys next to it. What about now? Go to HTTP keys for more information. Boom. How to access rapid API dot keys. Activity. Key rotation request external. I don't think I should leak the key out, but <laughs> never mind, doesn't matter. Map data, 10 per day, 5,000 regular request. Okay, so I got like 500. Cannot access. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, let's get back to this. It's back. Okay, awesome. Well, I've got a quiz that I'm going to add here, so I will do that now. Okay, here's a quiz for you to work on. Pause here and finish this quiz. <laughs> All right, so what's the difference between a base URL and an endpoint? Well, a base URL is the part. Here's the base. Here's the endpoint. Right? No, base is this. That won't change. And then API, and then V2, and then something like that. Get that you don't have. Which part is yeah, the endpoint for it, or a separate path for it? Endpoints in depth a little bit later. Well, we have a base URL. Users endpoint. That's we V2. Have a slash products endpoint. But then the tricky one is this last one. We see slash products slash one, two, three. This is a bit of a teaser for a future lesson, but the endpoint that's available isn't specifically slash products slash one, two, three, but it's actually slash products slash some ID of a product here. Uh -huh. If I were to do a request to slash users, I would actually expect to get an array of users back. Same with slash products. I would get an array of slash products back. But when I say slash products slash one, two, three, I'm trying to say as a designer of this API that you can get a single product, so an object, from amongst the list of products that are available through that quiz. And fortunately, we just have one more lecture like this before we actually get our hands on the code and start developing our blog space platform. So when you're ready, let's move on and learn about request methods. Let's dive into request methods. And you can see from our original list here, we have get, post, put, and delete. Now there's a few others that you probably won't be interacting with directly very often. So we're just gonna focus on these first four. So essentially what the method is doing is telling the server what kind of request you're making, or maybe 
a better way to say it is what your intention with that request is. For example, when I send a get request or a request with a method set to get, I'm asking the server to send me data. I'm trying to get data, which in context makes it pretty obvious why it's called get. However, there's other interaction types I might have with the server. For example, if I want to send new data to a server or to a database, I'll likely be sending a POST request. With a POST request, I'm not asking the server to send me data back, I'm asking the server to add new data. The name <coughs> makes a lot of sense when you think of it in terms mm. of like a blog post or a Facebook post. If I'm on Facebook and I type out my Facebook post and I hit send, essentially I'm asking Facebook to add something new to the Facebook database. And so I'm sending a POST request to Facebook. Now, this isn't only true of places that have something actually called a post, like a blog post. For example, if I have a to-do list that is maintained somewhere in the cloud on the internet, anytime I add a new item to my to-do list, I'm essentially sending a post request. I'm adding something in my data. The next method that we'll talk about is a put request. And this is whenever I want to edit or update or modify existing data. Strictly speaking, the put request will also add new data if the data you're trying to update doesn't actually exist. I personally haven't used it that way much. I really just think of a put request as a way to tell the server I want to update existing data. For example, let's talk about that to-do list we just mentioned. If I maybe made a typo in the to-do item that I just posted, I would probably click some kind of edit button that would allow me to fix my typo and then hit submit. In that case, I'm not necessarily adding something completely new the to-do item already existed when I added it. Instead, I'm just trying to update it. A request like that would oftentimes be a put request. And then another obvious one is the delete request. And this is whenever we want to remove data. If I want to delete my Facebook post or delete the to-do item that I made completely, then I would probably yeah. send a delete request to the server. Like we mentioned, there's a few others like patch or options. We are not gonna dive into those at this time. Now, I do want to relate these methods to code, but first I want us to do a quiz. So here's a quiz that I've typed out. Pause here and answer the questions on this quiz. Okay, so your task is to try and think of a time that you used each of these methods in the real world, probably unknowingly, not really having thought much about these methods before. So the get function, basically the when we need to work with APIs, we have to get some data. So in the real world, adding new data. So for example, so for example, today I checked the weather on my phone this morning. And when I did that, it probably sent a get request to retrieve the weather information from whatever API my weather app is using. So I'll go ahead and add that. Now for a post request, let's see. Well, when I created this new screencast that you're watching, I had to click new scrim and that probably sent a post request to Scrimba asking to create a new screencast. So I'll say created a new create a new screencast. So watching now. Okay, well for a put request, let's see. So I went grocery shopping last night. I have a shared to-do list with my wife and we add items for grocery shopping. And whenever I put one of the items in my cart, I mark it as completed on my list. At first glance, it might seem that that's kind of like a delete, I guess, because I'm removing it from my list. But in reality, all I'm doing is changing a property that probably says completed true or false. So I'll say marked items from my shared to-do list as completed. Again, I'm likely updating the database with that item, marking it as completed. And then delete, let's see. Well, recently on Slack, I typed a message, I hit send, and then I realized that I had made a mistake or something and I really didn't need to send that message. So I ended up just deleting, deleted mm -hmm. message on Slack. That was no longer necessary. The truth is each API can implement the different methods in whichever way makes the most sense to them. For some reason, I found it's rather common for an API to actually update data by using a post request. There might be great reasons to do it that way. I just don't know them myself. I have always used a put request when I'm writing an API and want to allow my users to update existing data. Now let's see this in practice a little bit. So 
we've learned about fetch. I'm going to get a URL, and this is just a JSON placeholder API URL. They have a to do's endpoint here. Let's try what it looks like. Oh, just a bunch of gibberish. Here, and this is what we're familiar with already. Me to access, I want it to do a get request method, and that's by providing a second parameter here. The first parameter is the URL or the path of where I'm trying to access. The second parameter is sort of an options object, and inside this object, I can specify a key called method and tell it that I want it to do a get request. And by doing this, I'm explicitly telling fetch to perform a get request, or rather to set the method of the request to get. Because it's the default, I never really do this. Mm. I'm just trying to do a get. But if I need to post data, then I will be doing a post request, in which case I would also need to provide something called the body, which we're going to talk about soon. But the point is I can change the method of the request using fetch by providing this second parameter, my options object. And that leads me to a really quick challenge for you to do. So just like we've done before, you're going to fetch a list of to-dos from the JSON placeholder API. I've provided the base URL and the endpoint, but this time, however, I want you to manually set the request method to a get method. So the default value is going to be get fetch. And then this here, to do however this time explicitly set method get do I need to put it into quotation mark I do quotation mark there we go Okay, pause here, work on this challenge, and we'll go through it together after. So this is a pretty crucial lesson. Fortunately, it's also time for us to jump into our blog space project, and we are going to start with that next. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to grab lunch. And then, yeah, maybe we would be able to go back and then finish up this but I want to start on my project the hiking app finish all the uh, HTML CSS now I want to go into the JavaScript and APIs so we will do this tonight right tonight 